and I'm sure we'll have other folks drift in um, during the discussion. It is seven o'clock, so why don't we go ahead and get started. Okay. Um, I want to welcome everyone to tonight's discussion about the financial impact that the COVID-19 pandemic is having on Virginia news organizations and their employees. This event has been organized by the Virginia Pro Chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists. My name is Jeff South. I'm the uh, chapter's president. We'll be discussing how news organizations, newspapers, and television stations are being affected economically by the coronavirus and the toll that the pandemic is taking on journalists in terms of job losses, furloughs, and other hardships. We'll also look at the long-term effects that the pandemic may have on the news media landscape and the journalism profession in Virginia. We have a panel of five media professionals whom we will introduce shortly. The discussion will be moderated by Marisa Porto, the former publisher and editor-in-chief for the Daily Press Media Group and now executive in residence at Hampton University. Marisa is well prepared for this role. She's been co-producing a series of videos titled We Virginians about public policy in the Commonwealth in a post-pandemic world. So here's our format. We'll hear from our panelists for about 45 minutes. And during that time, please keep your microphones muted. Then we'll take questions from the audience for about 15 minutes. So we'll wrap up by 8 p.m. And if you have questions as we go along, type them in the chat box. You can find that by putting your cursor at the bottom of your screen and you'll see a, a link to, uh, to the view version of the chat box. Um, in that chat box, before this event ends, I will post links to the SPJ Virginia Pro website, where later I'll post a video of this, this discussion. And I'll also provide links to the We Virginians, we Virginians video series and to the Virginia is for Journalists Relief Fund and to some other resources, including a video that Kim Greenwich, the vice president of NBC 12, provided of his station's empty newsroom. So without further ado, let me pass the microphone to Marisa Porto. Marisa. Thank you, Jeff. Let's get started by introducing the panelists. Um, Kim Greenwich is the general manager um, in Richmond, the NBC affiliate. Kim, if you would just share a little bit about yourself with our audience. Okay, uh, well, thank you first of all for putting this together. I think this will be very interesting uh, for some of the people that listen to it with a very diverse group we have. Well, I'm a native New Yorker, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, and have loved television probably since I was a kid. Um, went to St. John's University, uh, worked in sales and marketing at NBC and CBS in New York, moved here in 1990 as an account executive at WWDT. So I've been here for 29 years, actually be 30 years, August 15th. I thought I'd be here for five years when I moved my, my, my uh, family here. And it's just a, a fantastic market. And we're currently owned by Gray Television. And I became general manager in 2011. So I've spent a big part of my career here and love the Richmond community. Thank you. We'll move to uh, Michelle Pelletier, who um, is the marketing and branding expert uh, director at um, 13 News Now in Norfolk, and also is relatively new to uh, the area, having just moved here about three months ago. Michelle, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Of course. Uh, thanks for having me on the panel. Um, I was born in Boston and raised in Canada, so I have dual citizenship. I've always been passionate about broadcasting, and that's really what I studied in college. Um, after college, worked in Canada on a couple of TV shows and at a sports network, and then moved over to the States to really focus on marketing at local TV stations. From there, I ended up working for a syndicator um, on the programming. Michelle, can you tell us uh, a little bit, just a little bit about yourself? I know you were talking about how you're, uh, you're dual citizenship uh, and you've just moved here. Yes, I just moved here. I actually moved from um, Phoenix, Arizona, where I was working on a syndicated TV show called The List, uh, handling brand and marketing for them. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, before that, I was working for Warner Brothers, working on 
brands like TMZ and a couple of other TV shows. So really my background is in, um, my recent background has been more on the television, you know, syndication side, but my first love was always local TV news. And that's why I decided to, you know, take this role with 13 News Now to get back in the, you know, broadcasting 13 um, and the local news arena. Well, we're happy to have you back in Virginia. Thank you. Our next guest panelist is Sarah Gregory, an award-winning reporter from the Virginian Pilot. Um, Sarah, if you would be so kind as to share a little bit of background with us. Thank you. Yep, she is muted. Oh, I'm sorry. That's um, all right. <laughs> um, okay, there you go. Thank uh, you. No, there you go. Now she's on mute. Uh, so I'm an education reporter at the Virginian Pilot, and I have been here a little over two years, and I've been in Virginia for about five years covering K-12 education, and um, I'm also chair of the Tidewater Media Guild, which is the union that represents journalists at the Pilot and the Daily Press, the Virginia Gazette, and the Tidewater Review, and I've uh, worked uh, I'm part of the group that is working on the uh, relief fund. So that's a little bit of that. Well, welcome. Um, Allison Rabel, she is a reporter with The Daily Progress. Allison, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, yes. Uh, my name's Allison. I'm a reporter with The Daily Progress. I mostly cover Albemarle County government. Um, I've been here for about five years. Uh, my first job out of college um, and used to cover business and then switched to covering county government. Um, and I helped start the Virginia the Journalist Relief Fund. Um, okay. Why I'm here today. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Terry Biggie is the editor in um, Green County at the Green County Record. Terry, can you tell us a little bit about your background, please? Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, working in the. It's a weekly here in Green County, just north of Charlottesville, part of the Lee Network. Um, and I'm the editor, so I do everything. Um, we do our own layouts. We write about everything. And I have uh, been in journalism since 93. So I'll give you guys some idea of how old I am. Um, <laughs> and I, uh, I love investigative journalism, which I did at Virginia Tech, and would like to do more of, but we don't have a very big staff. All right. Well, let's get started. And I'm going to start with you, Kim, as the general man manager of an organization. You've seen the business model change over time, um, audience and advertising going to the digital, uh, migrating to digital platforms and, and trying to recreate um, or innovate in uh, the traditional business model. So can you tell us um, all of that as the backdrop to then COVID comes along and, um, and here we are. Can you hear me? Cause I can't hear you. Yes, sorry. Okay, now, now, okay. So uh, it's interesting, all of the change, uh, Marissa, that you talked about that television stations have been experiencing over time over the last 10 years has made us have to change our business model and not only get more involved in the web and the internet and everything that's involved with that, but we have all invested over the years in more and more technology. When March 13th came, uh, as I said to the group earlier, I remember Friday the 13th, when we got the word from corporate that everyone had to go home. We had been in talking about what we would do if in fact we had to leave the building totally or have people work remotely. And we at one point were talking about 100% of people working remotely. And we started talking about how would we do that, just like a lot of other news operations both radio, TV, broadcast, um, and newspaper. Um, and we sat down and we talked about it. We basically had a plan put together, but it wasn't 100%. But in a week's time, uh, out of 110 people that came into the television station, we have a max of 30 people that are ever in the station at any given time. 
And I was just truly amazed, particularly by the news department, about how they were able to do so much remotely right away. I guess the first innovation was our morning anchor, Andrew Frieden, morning uh, meteorologist. Andrew was secretly building a studio in his garage while this was going on. And in four days time, uh, the, the news director, Frank Jones, came to me and said, hey, Andrew wants to talk to you about something he wants to do. And I said, what is that? He said he wants to be able to broadcast remotely. And um, for me, it's like, well, everyone else can run away, but we have to be here doing broadcast television. Well, we found out that we had to be more flexible. And it was because of having the technology, because all of us have to innovate for a living, we were able to, in five days, pretty much clear the building, the newsroom at any given time, you, you might see seven people in there, and that's a crowd. Uh, reporters working remotely, doing their stories, editing them, sending them electronically, coming in the morning and doing, uh, having their morning meetings and doing all that remotely. I sat in on a lot of those calls and I was just amazed at not only that it got done, but it was done very efficiently. And there was no one that was really complaining about what they were doing. And that really set the tone for the rest of the building for those people who had to work remotely. So everything that we had to do to innovate and keep up with times over the last 10 years had most television stations, certainly our station, ready for prime time for this moment. And uh, even though it's certainly a new normal that I don't like, but it is one that I believe that we'll have to be in for several months. I'm sorry, the mute was on, let's get to that. So the next question for you, Kim, is um, what have you seen across uh, Virginia as far as the um, effects of the pandemic on the news industry? Well, uh, the, the, the biggest effect, first of all, as most of you know, when advertising dollars come, goes down, that affects everything. Um, we're owned by Great Television, and we're in a position that's not the same as every broadcast group, but some. But our CEO uh, basically did a video after two weeks when we were into this, and he talked about how we had survived uh, the downturn in 2008 and 9, how we survived 9-11. Uh, and during all those times, they said that great television never did a furlough, never laid anyone off, and never cut salaries. He said, so you guys uh, need to just do your jobs, do them well, and don't worry about losing income. Now, that was true for everyone except for the sales staff. Uh, we did do uh, something pretty good for the sales staff to try to keep them whole, not 100%. But that revenue went down. And on average, probably stations, TV stations, I can speak mostly for, probably in, in uh, April and May particularly, lost 30 to 40% of anticipated revenue. So that's a hit. So we didn't go to a period where we started cutting everything, but we actually had to spend money because we had to buy laptops, we had to get people new microphones, get poles for microphones, get PPE uh, gear for people, had to get sanitizers, and a lot of stations really had to do a lot of that on their own until corporate would catch up but they gave us the freedom to do that. But certainly across the landscape, we've had furloughs. We've had money uh, that's been cut. Uh, we know that the future is coming where we'll definitely have to tighten our belts. And so this is going to be a tough year for everyone uh, because the money will not be coming back in big terms for a while. There is good news. June looks much better than April and May. So I'm optimistic about that for our business. As we open up, that's gonna be a good thing, and then hopefully we don't have a resurgence where we have to shelter in place again, because that won't be good for business. But the biggest thing for me is that I've seen the morale and the productivity and efficiency of particularly our news department has, has really simply amazed me. Um, I didn't truly think that we could get it done. If you had asked me to do this a year ago and say do it in five days, I would have told you that it could not be done. And um, so I don't know a more innovative people than news people, but it will be tough. And some of the organizations, they have been layoff and they have been furloughs, uh, up to 20% uh, cuts with some people's salaries. So certainly across the industry, this is gonna, going to take a toll. And uh, it's the responsibility of GMs and the advertising community and our 
uh, business community to try to bring that revenue back in so that we can bring our business back to health. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Kim. Uh, I, this is a good time for us to go to Michelle. Michelle, um, there, you know, clearly Kim was talking about um, an ad revenue decline uh, uh, during the first few months of the pandemic. Um, you know, you're already dealing with the business industry change. Um, you know, he also mentioned layoffs in the sales and marketing teams. Um, can you tell us what you're seeing in your organization and um, what has happened to your team and your ad revenue? Well, from a, you know, from a revenue perspective, obviously there's been there's been some loss, but I think there's you know mostly, and I'm trying to be you know kind of a positive positive play <laughs> on it here. You know, I think you know the biggest thing is from a marketing standpoint and from a news coverage standpoint, we've seen huge amounts of viewership increase in you know most of our newscasts. We have a a new audience that's coming to local news due to the fact that they're actually trusting local news. You know, and for example, our our demos for millennials and you know people of the younger you know, younger viewers have gone up tremendously, not just for our station but also for our station group Tegna. So we've seen a huge opportunity there, not only with you know linear but all, also with digital. I think a lot of people are being you know are sampling local news right now, and it's a good thing for us. I understand the revenue part. I'm not so much in, involved in the revenue, you know, in the revenue part because, you know, I'm not involved in the sales department. But, you know, from a marketing standpoint, I think this has been a very, very interesting, you know, time for us uh, due to the fact that we're really talking on a daily basis to a new audience that would have not come to, you know, our medium if it wasn't for COVID-19. Well, um, let's move to uh, Sarah. Sarah, um, you know, since 2008, the Pew Research Center has said uh, that uh, news organizations have eliminated positions, half their positions um, in, in organizations across the country. Um, you know, the, that was happening long before COVID-19. Um, can you tell us about the impact financially and emotionally that um, is happening to your colleagues in your organization? Yeah, so I mean, I think we're all really concerned um, that jobs will be eliminated. We've gone through two rounds of buyouts in the last two years, most recently in January when we saw about 20 colleagues walk out the door. And um, so we were already feeling sort of short staffed and feeling those pressures of trying to you know, cover all the news in Hampton Roads. And so that that pressure that we're feeling, I think, has just been um, accelerated and exacerbated by the COVID-19 challenges. Um, we are also now in week three of furloughs. This is something that Tribune is doing company-wide. And so folks who make above a certain threshold are having to take um, three weeks of furlough between May and the end of July. And so, um, that's, you know, adding another um, bit of uncertainty to, to all of our lives. So, um, you know, I'm on furlough this week. This is my first one. And it's been uh, hard sort of uh, staying away from the news. You know, I've had two sources text me actually like while we were talking and I can't look at, you know, I can't respond to them and I can't, um, I, I can't do my job the way we all want to do our jobs and 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 that's been really hard I think that uh, people are really struggling with that and in the weeks when they're here they're you know they're working hard to make sure that um, their colleagues are not going to be having to scramble to cover too much for them or that if they are that you know they're trying to like leave notes and like tips and sources and and all of that stuff is like extra work that we're doing on top of sort of covering, you know, one of the biggest news stories uh, of our generation. So the financial stress and uncertainty about our jobs has, has sort of always been there, but it does feel heightened right now. Thank you. Um, we'll go to Allison. Allison, as I understand it, that one of the ways that you have been um, trying to um, help is uh, is to to start a fund so um can you tell us a little bit about the fund 
tell us a little bit about what started, uh, what sparked the interest in that, and um, and and how many uh, folks have you helped so far through the fund? Um, well, so my coworker Catherine and I um, had started to see that places were furloughing um, and or laying off journalists. Um, in, I don't think it really had hit Virginia too much yet, but we started to see some papers um, and some companies were doing it. And we were talking amongst ourselves about doing something specifically for our newsroom um, and our staff. Um, and then I think um, Catherine was like, well, we could, we could go bigger than this and we could do a Virginia thing. And she'd reach out to Sarah um, and um, some people in Roanoke, um, other guilds um, and kind of, decided that we would do something for Virginia journalists, um, uh, specifically mostly print journalists and freelancers who typically write um, for print media. Um, and we've, I, I think, uh, close to 20. Um, there were a lot more people in the beginning, I think. Uh, I think a lot of people have realized that the extra $600 with the unemployment um, is pretty helpful for the time being. Um, that's obviously only going to be here until the end of July at this point. So um, we're expecting some more uh, people will be requesting funds after that um, if nothing gets extended or renewed. Um, and especially, um, we don't know what's going to happen next quarter. Um, and layoffs could be on the table at some places. Um, so uh, we're, we're definitely glad we still have um, quite a bit of funds uh, left to distribute. Um, we've talked about what happens if if things go a little bit back to normal, like what we do with this money, um, nothing obviously is solid yet, but um, a lot of people who have asked for funds um, either were, like I said at the beginning, and weren't expecting to get furloughed um, and realized that they weren't going to have money to pay a bill that was due this week when they thought they were, um, or in a coming week, um, or had an emergency where they needed um, additional funds anyways. Um, and so um, it, it's been nice because we call everybody and talk to them about what's going on. Um, and it, it's, 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 it's nice to hear that at this point, no one's um, too badly affected by all this. Um, but uh, it, it worries me a little bit going into the future about what the situation will be. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Allison. We appreciate that. Um, Terry, let's get to you. You have a different, a uh, little bit of a different uh, market. You're a weekly. Uh, yes. So uh, it's, much, it's much smaller than uh, most everyone here on this call. Um, can you tell us um, what the long-term impact has been or, or what, the, what the impact has been on your organization? And then maybe tell us a little bit about what you think the impact might be on the citizens of Virginia. Uh, because of what's happening in the news industry around the around the Commonwealth. Sure. So um, we're outside of Charlottesville, and the Daily Progress is our daily paper. Mm -hmm. But short staff there means they don't get to cover the extended counties much. So the weeklies that are out here are the most local news that these people get. Um, we're at all the local meetings, we're at, you know, the kids' soccer games and all kinds of stuff like that. And um, people really love that. I'm in a place where I don't think this will exist past June 30th. The new uh, fiscal year is July 1 for Lee Enterprises, and I'd be really surprised if the weeklies make it past there. And that's a big problem for, um, local communities because the we've been here since 1903 and it's the only paper that's ever been dedicated directly to Greene County. It's a small county, uh, 20,000 people, but it does keep, keep everybody together. You know, we've got church listings and, and all the things that people really care about. And it's not just going to be here. It's everywhere that doesn't have a local newspaper anymore they might i feel like they'll lose a lot of their identity we do have media um you know television in charlottesville they're only up here when it hits the fan which honestly in green it hits the fan a lot more than you would expect um but we don't get the coverage the way the charlottesville does and for people of green 
they they'll miss they'll miss having the Greene County news. So is your expectation that in a few months you you may well not have a newspaper and you may not have a job? Yes, I am preparing myself for that expectation 100%. What does that mean when you say you're preparing yourself for that in the middle of a pandemic? <laughs> um, I am trying to think outside the box of what I can do if that happens for the people of Green. Um, are there ways to create my own paper? Is there a way to let me buy that paper or at least the name? They don't own the building, so the only thing they own would be the name. Um, and people of green have been worried and asked if they could start donating to us. Um, which right now we've said no. Uh, um, so I think people would rally, mm -hmm. but I think it would be different. I wouldn't have benefits. I wouldn't have 401k. There's a lot mm -hmm. to lose at that. Um, I'm luckier than, than a lot because I'm married, but I worry that mm -hmm they'll lose a lot of information. Mm -hmm. So what would you tell uh, the public or legislators uh, about the situation that the news industry finds itself in today? And um, is there any way that, uh, that they can help in, 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 this, in this time of need? If <laughs> yeah, I'm not against newspapers, you know, getting grants from from the federal government or you know stimulus packages, I worry a little about the. I don't know what the word is, but uh, the the appearance of of an influence by a political party or political system. But at the same time, I think we're going to have to find a way to raise money other than our typical models and. Mm -hmm going the nonprofit route or somehow combining with a nonprofit, I think that would be a good start for local papers. Okay. For local papers. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. Um, Michelle, so the um, it's pretty clear that the pandemic has had a negative effect on the news industry across uh, the Commonwealth, uh, but you're in the marketing and branding part of uh, a news organization. Has there been any positive um, outcome uh, from the, the, the news industries, um, you know, the news industry's consolidation and the issues that it's facing in, the, in, this, in this time of COVID? Um, from a marketing standpoint, I, I really haven't, you know, seen anything, you know, I've seen, a lot of uh, a lot of pivoting from our advertisers. Uh, mm -hmm. That's obviously you know, something that I'm working with um, as a director of marketing and responsible for the relationship with advertisers. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of our advertisers change, you know, and cancel their buys, and then change the way they're operating. I think the messaging has changed tremendously. We've mm -hmm. gone from a you know, message of hard sell to really a, I call it brand activism, where every, every advertiser has had to reach out to the community and reach out to their customers in a totally different, different way. Um, you know, we have helped our advertisers um, reach out to the community and, you know, really actually send messages that have been very positive overall for the community through, you know, their advertising. So that's something that we've seen that's been very positive besides the ratings, obviously, and the, you know, the, the new audience that we've seen uh, also, you know, for our news product. I think, you know, the advertising, the advertising community has had to really pivot the way they're doing business. And that's pretty much the biggest change from, from my perspective. Okay. Um, Sarah and Allison, uh, perhaps you could answer for uh, us. Um, do you think the pandemic um, and the financial issues caused by it will have long-term effects on your yourself or your colleagues um, as far as you know, sort of emotional and financial um, uh, effects. 
Yeah, no, I, I think that it will. I think that a lot of people are, um, there are a lot of people who have been sort of um, struggling with the uncertainty of the industry for a while and are now, you know, this is their breaking point, right? Like this is the point at which they decide, like I, I need to find something more stable than news. And so I worry that um, a lot of my colleagues won't continue to see this as a viable career you know, one year down the road, I think um, that's going to be a big concern. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that like we're, we're going to see the long-term effects just by, you know, the continued whittling away of our newsrooms, right? Like they're getting smaller and smaller and um, there's not less news to cover, right? Um, so we're not, um, we're not able to go into things as in depth as we might want to all the time. And we're having to make tough choices about what we cover and what we don't cover. And down the road, I think that that will, I think readers will see that. Um, I think, um, you know, I, I think my colleagues see that. And I think we, I, I say a lot, like I wish readers could see how hard we all work behind the scenes to make, uh, to make it so the readers don't see what, um, we're having to sort of scramble to, to cover and fill in the gaps for, you know, one person doing a job that was done by three people a couple of years ago. But um, I think there's going to be a point at which, you know, we can't cover that up. Right. I think. Um, and, and I think that our communities will start to sort of feel the consequences of not having a, like, a strong watchdog looking at them. Mm -hmm. Allison, do you have any um, concerns in particular about your organization and what you're seeing across the state? Um, we already uh, had empty positions before this that we don't know why they weren't filling. Um, most recently, we were told it was because of the pandemic. Um, the positions are still budgeted, but they're not actively trying to fill them right now. One being uh, the University of Virginia slash the hospital system uh, or, or health reporter, um, which obviously is probably the most important position uh, to have filled right now. And uh, that has been open since October. Um, and uh, luckily, in a weird way, um, the, the reporter who had been in that position uh, last got promoted. So she's still here and is able to help us when we do have breaking news or, or big things we need to cover in that situation. Um, but uh, we don't know how much longer that is going to last. Um, and that is a, a, a big, important position now and always. Um, University of Virginia is the number one employer in this community. And you add in the hospital system, and it's definitely number one. Um, and uh, it's, it's, I covered a big story last week about it um, before I was furloughed. And uh, it's something that I feel if we had had a dedicated reporter on that beat still, that that story would have come out weeks ago. Um, and perhaps we would have gotten uh, more stories about the situation with the furloughs there um, in the time being since then. Uh, and kind of what Terry was saying, I've, I've had people reach out to me and say, like, if, if one of you leave um, during all of this right now, do you think they're going to fill your positions? And are we going to have uh, an empty city a Charlottesville reporter, an empty Albemarle County reporter, empty cops reporter. Um, so it's, um, it's, it's it, the difficulty in explaining to people, I, I don't know the answer. Um, and I, I don't want to discourage people um, from paying attention to what's going on, um, because it's important. And I know a lot of people care. Um, but I feel like the, the news is it is usually not great. Um, it's, it's we don't know either or uh, um, our guess is as best as your guess in, a, in situations um, like this. So uh, it's, it's definitely a little nerve wracking. Um, and just the thought of I mean, we've already had, we've had a business reporter position open for a year and a half and we're just assuming that that's gone now. Um, and then we have a UVA sports reporter open, which um, I, I understand a little bit why they're not filling it at the moment, but um, it's been open since October as well. Uh, so that could have been filled a long time ago and it's not. Um, so it's just um, a little, a little nerve wracking to know when the next shoe is going to drop. Right. Right. So Kim, I'm going to wrap it up with, we've, we've run a little long tonight. So thanks 
the audience for, for sticking with us. Um, but I know we have some questions. I want to ask the last, my last question to you, Kim. Um, you know, before COVID, you could see some news organizations um, close, shutting down, closing, right? Um, you could see some of them moving from a for-profit model to a non-profit model. You see a lot of entrepreneurial efforts in the news um, industry right now. And then COVID has come along and um, here we are. And um, some of the news organizations obviously are in a better financial position than others. Can you tell us, um, you know, what you think this watershed event is, is going to do, um, you know, to change the business model and, and what you think the long-term effects are in the news industry in Virginia? I, I know this won't sound um, like it's reality for a lot of us that are on this call, particularly for some organizations, um, as Sarah said, might not exist um, in a couple of months. Um, some people, some places weeks, and that's a lot of radio stations, some TV stations, newspapers for sure. But I do feel that when this is all over, that we will be a stronger industry than we've ever been before. And here are the reasons why. We've had to innovate more than ever before. And the most important thing that any audience knows is that the most important news that they receive is local news. Is local news that is going on in your community. One of the first things that we talk was not just what we could do for our staff, but what would we do as a station to make sure that we stood up for the community, not only bringing them news that they needed to hear, but what about all those nonprofit organizations that would not make it? So we partnered with the Community Foundation and also with the United Way, and we wanted to know, we know that there's a relief fund, where is the money going? We wanted to know that that money was going directly to organizations that need to be stood up, not just right now, but for the next two years. This is when leadership from all of us matters so much. And this is also the time that we have to, because we're being forced to reinvent ourselves. I believe that when we come out of this, there'll be more partnerships. There'll probably have to be more partnerships between newspapers and broadcast stations and radio stations. The National Association of Broadcasters, we're already talking about what can we do more and not less? Because the one thing I do believe is that we have to walk, run, stand on our heads, dance, and chew gum at the same time. And I believe that we absolutely can do it. And it's forums like this where we'll have to share ideas when we know that someone is in trouble, I believe that government funds that the NAB and the VAB is fighting hard to get, I believe they should go to local organizations like yours because your weekly, my TV station, a radio station, newspaper is no different than any other essential organization. We are the first responders and first informers, and we all take that very seriously. I think that this industry is going to change. Sometimes change comes because you're forced to change, and sometimes change comes because you're being very innovative. This is one of those times when we're being forced to change, and I believe we'll come out good on the other side. Now, if there is an opportunity, so what do you do? So Sarah talked about what's the next thing. Terry talked about what's the next thing. Um, want to consume that media online. We've seen that there is a millennial audience. I'm sorry, it'll be a long time before they get up and watch us every single day, even though they're doing it now and there's testing, but we are trying to make sure we reach them online. We are trying to do an OTT channel and make sure that we do something different than we've done before. All of this has forced us to actually be more innovative and more productive and also to listen to more voices than just the news director the general manager, and the marketing director. Because people will tell you what it is they like and what they don't, especially when they're sitting at home 24 uh, seven. Just go on social media. And I tell people, any email that comes into the station, whoever it comes from, whether they hate what you're saying, whether they think you're biased, whether they think you're just a fake news media, answer every single email with the facts. It is amazing that when you take the time to be courteous, you respond to them directly. I have never had someone come back and ever fight again against the facts because they know what the truth is. They're just angry. Uh, and we're in an angry society right now. So I believe that what we do 
matters more than it ever has before in the history of our industry. And I seriously mean that. We're going to be the ones who bring the public through this pandemic. We're the ones who are going to tell them, yes, this is what you should do when you're outside. Ignore people who don't believe in listening to the rules that we need to follow. Just continue to give the facts that at the end of the day, our business is not to be led by the public. We need to listen to them, but we need to continue to give them information that they need. And as Michelle said, and this is a lot with broadcast, but it is also online. I think of print as whether I read it with a newspaper or whether I read it on this screen. Both have value and we have to evolve. And I think that um, partnerships and innovation is going to be the thing that brings us through. And there is an audience, an advertising audience, that is willing to pay for that value. I have more subscriptions to things that I don't even know how I got that subscription, but I pay $5 uh, a month so I can get that New York Times or that weekly. You go and you say to that weekly, people say they want to donate money, say what I'd rather you do is subscribe to my online service. Mm -hmm. That People are willing to do that because you're the only ones who are going to be in your community giving them that local news that they need. We need weeklies. We need newspapers and broadcasting. We need the newspapers to stand up. We need them to be online because as you know, the way we run, we can't cover all those stories, but we love it when we say, can you also stream this from my community? Oh yes, I can do that because I don't have to leave the building to do that. So I could go on forever, but I am a, an optimist and I truly feel that we are gonna come out on the other side better. And what we have to do is call each other and say, hey, Kim, hey, Marissa, like what you said the other night, keep me in mind, this is my resume, this is what I offer in terms of value, and we have to help each other achieve more excellence. And I believe that we can continue to do that. That seems like a nice place to stop and um, turn it over to Jeff and say, Jeff, um, do we have any questions from the audience? Okay, so, um the, the Zoom bombers, who I mm. trying to block every single one and kick them out, they pretty much um, vandalized our chat box. So we're not mm. going to use the chat box. Don't even look wow. at the chat box. It's not okay. worth it. Um, but um, we can, uh, I can unmute people, or if you want to raise your hand, if you've got a question. Um, in fact, let me let me just put Greg Gilligan on the spot because he because you're such a good interviewer, Greg. Let me so I've um, invited you to unmute and what what questions what question might come to your mind after listening to this discussion? Well, I think you know the, I'm not sure it's a question, but in terms of the discussion, you know I fear that. You know, for Lee Enterprises, which there are three newspapers here with Lee Enterprises, including myself, um, we had to take uh, two weeks of furlough, either in April, May, or June. I'm taking my week this week as well. Um, and we had to do it by the end of June. My fear is what's going to happen after June, after you know, when July 1st rolls around. And um, whoever said that they thought our fiscal year ended June 30th, it does not. It, the the, the uh, fiscal year doesn't end until September. So they changed it somehow. I'm not sure when they changed it, but they changed it. Um, I can't, I was trying to, to find that information. And, and Lee also, I mean, while they have the cash on hand, um, Lee's uh, stock price has fallen below uh, the necessary requirements of the New York Stock Exchange. So they're also in trouble there too. Mm. So. So the real question not no one goes, okay, so let's say we have to take more furlough the second half of the year. Well, what happens to all of our vacation time? So now you're going to have people on, you know, because most people have taken the furlough, haven't taken any vacation. This is the first time I've had off since the beginning of the year. Um, and this is a furlough week versus a vacation week. And normally I would have had two or three weeks of, of uh, vacation by now. So that, that, that's going to be a concern as to, to, you know, going forward. What's going to happen um, to people, um, whether it's our organization or other organizations? Now, I'll also say, switching gears too, that at the Times Dispatch, we've been lucky. We've actually have hired, I want to say, like four or five different reporters and editors in the last um, you know two months, and we have um, an, an opening right now that we're actively seeking hiring a, a news editor for our government team. 
Um, so our healthcare reporter left at the beginning of um, May, and and so one of our, our government team re, uh, editors, she decided she wanted to go back to reporting, so she's doing that. But we've, we've hired um, you know two uh, government reporters, local government reporters, so I guess we're, we're the flip. Of, of what others and how, why are we able to do it and the others aren't, I'm not really sure. Other folks who might want to chime in either with a question or a comment. Sure. Got it, Logan. Thanks. Um, I wanted to ask if anyone has been feeling like compassion fatigue that you're hearing all these stories from everyone in your community and then you yourself as a reporter kind of have to like Sarah was mentioning you just kind of tuck it away and you try not to tell readers what you're feeling day to day. I'll, I'll take this. I mean, I think definitely. Um, that's been um, that, I mean, that's sort of part of our jobs normally, but we have been hearing from a lot. A lot more people are struggling now, and so we're hearing from a lot more people. Um, I think, like on the flip side, it's sort of um, it's been a way to connect with sources. Like when I've talked with them, um, because there is this like shared experience that we are all going through, um, and um, it I think has um made me more empathetic and i think it has made sources um i just think that like um we've been able to have like richer conversations almost because of it just um because we are all sort of understanding everyone's in the same boat um but yeah i mean it does it does wear on you and i think someone said earlier like your your home is your work and your work is your home and there's very little like separation between the two so and um, journalists aren't really known for being able to separate those two to begin with. So um, yeah, that's definitely obviously gotten harder right now. I've been having um, not so much compassion fatigue, but um, creative fatigue and being able to come up with the story ideas. We, I have a feature publication that I just started. Um, everything was humming along. Um, and we had advertisers coming on board and it's a features publication and we had to kind of like go and you know we were humming along and had all these great ideas and had to come and stop um, literally tear down our website um, because it was all about you know getting out and about on the peninsula tear it down and say okay now we're going to be going online and now it's coming about about like how we have to be you know just re reverse things and be creative online and um, we were so happy that now um, there's gonna be a band playing at a local restaurant this weekend. And it was like, okay, this is front page news because there's gonna be a band and they're playing on a piano, on a patio. And it was like, wow, you know? And, but, but it was, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of creative fatigue I've, I've been having a little bit of. And it was um, hard. And, you know, the, uh, the, lo the local uh, animal shelter has no, no longer taking appointments, but they're opening their doors at, you know 10 people at a time and it was like wow we got they got 30 kittens in and that's a big thing and so but yeah there's been like more of a, a creative fatigue that i've been you know having that that's been and and i've been working from home for 15 years so i'm kind of laughing at these people that are, are complaining about working from home but um yeah that's that's been hard is the creative fatigue and i also have a high school senior so there's just kind of this double whammy that has been hitting my family a little bit hard um you know, but yeah, that's, that's the fatigue I'm, you know, been having a little bit of. But yeah, I've been getting a lot of support from advertisers, but in a way that they're like, they want to come in, but they're just saying, not now. You know, just call me, call me in a month. And Brett, did you have a... That was actually a great launching point. I was going to ask, that's, uh, for anyone that doesn't know, I'm Brett. I work at Wavy TV 10 in uh, Norfolk, and I was going to ask uh, Kim and anybody else can chime in just about the future or what you are hearing from advertising because I know right now under the current business model that's where a lot of it comes from and 
one of the scariest things to me is what maybe a few weeks ago on 60 Minutes when they went to Ford and GM in Detroit, Michigan, and talked about making ventilators. Uh, I think Noro or whoever did the uh, piece basically said in the last month, zero trucks were made here. And I know I was taught from an uh, you know, early age is that, you know, the auto industry, when gas guzzlers went down, that's where the 2008 TV news got punched in the gut. And I'm sure it is the same for newspapers, local car dealerships. So what's, what, what are we looking at there in as much insight as anyone here could, could provide? Are they going to, I mean, if we don't sell cars, or is that really going to, yeah, things going to get worse? Um, I wish I could predict 100%. Uh, but I can definitely predict month to month. Um, one of the things that we are seeing, and I do predict that you're going to see a couple of things. The, will we go into a recession? If you watch CNBC during the day and you talk to 10 of the people, some will say yes, but it'll be a different recession than we've ever had. People will say, well, not really a recession. It'll be a little bit of a slow downturn. And then others will say, you know what? I really don't know. But, but here's what I, I am seeing uh, in the community. Uh, we have certain TV uh, in the car industry advertisers. Some never went off of TV. They dropped what they were doing. They lowered their numbers. And I probably called more owners in business than I have ever done in my career. Because I think this is a time when you need to let them know uh, personally that you care. So I talked to uh, Crossroads Automotive. I was just curious as to... And I asked him, I said, what made you stay on the air? He said, because I've realized that one, people are still watching a lot of TV. And as Michelle said before, the TV advertising is actually, the viewership is actually up. And he said, I know that I won't sell as many cars as I have before, but if I disappear altogether and not offer people deals, then I won't sell any cars at all. So he values advertising. What he values is what, people value is the content that all of you all create every day. So for me, when I look at the numbers right now, I know that June looks better than April. April looked better than May. And by now, because we will be in June in a couple of days, I had more cancellations on my station this time, April going into May. I'm not seeing them right now. So people are holding on. So I think that where I might've been down, uh, not numbers to publish, but just off the record, where I may have been down 35% in May, I think that June will be more like minus 20%. Now, we never go home and praise being down by 20%, but for the people like you who have a partnership with relying on advertising, ready to go. Here's another interesting thing. May was the largest new business development month of the year. New business development that account executives did from home. So who advertised? Some banks were on, never on before. What were they on? Talking about goodwill, helping the community. Others were on offering a deal. If you set an appointment with us, we'll give you a $25 certificate to go to a local restaurant. We've never seen clients show their heart more than ever before and understand that people love it. Paramount Builders, he was going to do a deal with one station in the market. He came to us. He definitely drove a hard bargain, but we had inventory. Um, and what he did... This is the CEO of the company. Every time this commercial comes on, I still watch it. He came on, he says, I know that these are hard times. Everybody's hurting, went on. And then he talked about, if you set an appointment about getting a new roof or new shutters or whatever it is, but every appointment, every appointment, not every sale, I will give a $25 gift certificate to you to use at a local restaurant. Okay, then he changed his copy to, we are now recruiting. This is real life story. We are now recruiting. His new copy was because he was doing well, people were at home, want to do projects, get that deck done, time for you to you know, change that siding on the house. So there is momentum that is building there. And I believe that it will begin to continue to build with the different industries. It's just going to be a slower uh, incline than maybe we would see when the economy just gets jump started. The account executives are more excited than ever because they've been able to see how productive they could be from being on the phone, calling someone you don't know, and actually doing what you do is say, hey, we have great content and we want to introduce your product to an audience. So I'm a business person. 
And when they ask us for forecasts, my forecast for June is up. Uh, most of my colleagues, the forecast for June is up. What will happen will really depend on consumers like you who say, okay, I'm gonna continue to spend online, but I'm also gonna start now spending in the local economy, but we're gonna to have to do it carefully and slowly. We could open up all the malls, sell everybody, go shoulder to shoulder. We could do that tomorrow and guess what? There is a good percentage of people that will go in there and buy all those products. That would be a mistake because what we don't wanna have is a setback. So we just have to do this in an incremental way. But I believe that it will get better but it will take us a time to get back to uh, where we were. How long that will be? Could be a year. Uh, I don't wanna be that pessimistic, but could be. Here's the other thing that's coming uh, that doesn't affect everybody, but it's gonna come in a big way. It's that ugly word, but great dollars that people love and it pays the rent, political advertising. It's gonna be coming in droves come September. It is gonna be huge and it's going to be that catalyst for our market that is going to tighten up the inventory so that we can continue to uh, sell to other advertisers, but it's gonna also help the economy. And because they haven't been spending a lot of money on advertising, there is a backlog on that money and you're gonna be sick of TV advertising in the fourth quarter, I promise you. But this is one time when everybody should say, bring on those dollars, whether they're in newspaper, radio, all of the collective money whether it's in TV or radio or newspaper, it helps all of us. It really does. And you're going to see that come. So um, I'm not just a phony optimistic person. When I think the news is not going to be good, I, I say it and I say it to my people because sometimes you have to go and say, we got to cut budget by 5%. I've had many of those conversations. But I'm telling people now, you do your work. And this is when leadership really matters a lot. Staying in touch with your people, letting them know that you care about them but more importantly, letting all the segments in your individual communities going out there and let them know by your content that you cover that you care about all communities. Equity now, inclusion, and all of those things are more important than ever before. People are watching us closer than ever before, and when you ignore their story, that's when they will leave you and not come back. So Brent, I think what you all are doing is gonna to continue to be well, it's just going to be different. And Michelle, since you've got your ear to, of course, the advertising world, how does that resonate with you? Do, you? do you also see a comeback in advertising once this thing is over? Sorry, I had to mute. Uh, yes, definitely. I mean, I think, you know, like Kim said, it's going to be, you know, slow slower uh, we see you know political definitely being very strong in September I think the advertisers you know like I said earlier they're pivoting their message being more community oriented but also they will be more creative also in the way they reach out to their ad you know to their clients to their customers so I think there's definitely you know a lot of hope there and um, there's definitely a lot of uh, innovation and you know, from a marketing and advertising standpoint, that will you know kind of keep the business going, in my opinion. Right. Well, um, that brings us right to eight o'clock, and so um, I think we might want to end the discussion here. But I do have those links that I'm going to post on the Virginia Pro J website. So later on, if you go to spjva.com, that's where um, I'll put. Uh, links to um, some articles that some of the panelists and Marisa had sent me and so uh, I'll put those there. Um, I really want to thank you guys for joining in on this, this discussion for our panelists, for Marisa and for all the um, members of the audience. I apologize again for the Zoom bombing, my first experience. And <laughs> Mine too. <laughs>